Single wheel and over under mission? Uh, I'm blank, sorry. Then we have a double wheel. We can get you uh, more intricate designs than chevrons or triple diamonds. As you see. Uh, steel needles, flat strap, and glass feet. <laughs> <laughs> Before European contact, we would use uh, hemp fibers to make our thread. Our needles came from the shin bone right above the joint of a deer. The ankle joint, excuse me. We would use seashells, corn beads, and clay beads for our beads before contact. Now, ow. now this is an example of some of the first glass beads we would use. They came in a long tube and we had to size and shape them ourselves. We would use mountain bison teeth, various claws from animals, and bone as well for our beads. <coughs> we also have two different styles of beadwork we would use. The first is called scroll work, as you see here. Now we'll go down the side of a man's legging or pants, or along the bottom of a woman's dress. We found the clay after we got the clay and got it back home and kind of spread it out a little bit to look for the impurities, the sticks, the stones, uh, roots, sand, anything that would make it bust in the firing process. <coughs> now after that was done, we had two methods we would use. The first is the ball method, where we would take the clay, roll it into a ball with our hands. From there, we would use our hands to make the various pottery, faces, bowls, anything. It was all done by hand. There was no spinning wheels involved. The second method is called coil method, where we take the clay, make it into a little flat disc, and then roll clay into long strands and just stack it up on top of each other. Look at that. Yeah. <coughs> Alright, as you see, we're at our wood carving section. Now, a lot of things, as with most of it all, before contact, flint was our most versatile thing we would use. It would make our tools, our weapons, anything like that. So we would make our mask out of tree bark for gourds. Now if you don't know what a gourd is, it's similar to a squash or pumpkin. Once you cleaned it out, we let it dry, hard, and then we use our mask or spoons or ladles for bowls. Now how we got the holes drilled into the pipes came from this, a simple bow drill. Now just like today's power tool, the tip will be interchangeable. Just undo the sinew and replace it, you know, bigger or smaller, whatever you need it for. This piece would have been made of stone for weight, and all you simply do is just stick it down where you need to drill your hole. Can you bend it? Oh, yeah, we got to fix that. Bend. It's trying to wobble. I didn't, I didn't do it. <laughs> Sharp, but they can still slice it pretty easy. Now our basket beforehand, as I said, we made a tree bark. This is hickory, hickory bark. Oh, wow. We want to take a guess how old it is. Couple hundred. None of us are that, that young. Old. All right. Huh? Good guess though. What? Older than all of us. Hundred. It's made in the 1950s. Okay. <laughs> Maybe older than me. <laughs> Yeah, now, this isn't treated, by the way. Just if you take good care of the baskets, you know, and they can last, and it's still durable. I mean, now we had two types of baskets we would do. The first weave is a single weave, over under method. Start from the bottom, work your way up. The second would be a double weave. We start on the inside of the basket, work our way up, bend them back down, finish on the outside bottom. Now, if you look, you can see the two layers. Oh wow! And this was used to carry water. Now, if this wasn't completely waterproof, we would take pine raisin or beeswax and smear it on the inside, and that made it waterproof. On the side, I don't know if you're working on it. They're making uh, arrowheads. So what they're doing is called flint napping. So they're taking the stone, taking another rock, and chipping away at it, getting the overall size and shape. Now, after that's done, they're going to take a deer antler, and what's called pressure flakes. So they take it and put the edges onto it. And we mainly use flint. And obsidian. Now, I explained what flint was. Obsidian 
looks like this. Volcanic glass. Got from trade from uh, South American Frog. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, shoulder that you see here. Now this is tied to the arrow with uh, hemp fibers. Now this was used for hunting, so if you shot the arrow, you can walk up, pull the uh, animal, walk up, pull the arrow back out, really easy. The second one is called a square shoulder, which you see it is made of obsidian, tied with sinew. Now obsidian, as I said, is volcanic glass. So if you were to get shot by this and you hit one of your bones, the glass is going to shatter, causing infection, possible death. Also, the sinew plays an effect too, because if the arrow don't shatter, the sinew is going to soak up blood and become real loose. So if you try to pull the arrow out, the arrow is going to come undone and stay inside you. And then the only way to get this this one out is either push it on through out, out your back, or take your flint knife and go fishing for it. So either way, it's not going to be a good thing for you. No, no, no. Now the arrow itself is made out of mountain cane, which grows is similar to the river cane, just higher up in elevations, and probably a few feet tall, and about this about thick as it gets. The fletchies is turkey feathers, split in half and tied to each side with a little twist. So if you shot it, when you shot it, it would spin, creating giving it more accuracy at distances. The bow is made out of yellow locust, strong, flexible wood, and the shrimp stream is either hemp fibers or barren testes. The barren testes will be laid out and dried. Once dried, we twist them and intertwine them together and make really strong holes. Give you about 60 to 75 pounds worth of draw strength. And you could launch an arrow, if you were skilled enough, about 100 yards. So about a football field in length. Think about that. But our people really didn't like to use arrows because we thought it was kind of dishonorable for your enemy not to see who was killing them. So, kids about five or six years old will start using a blow gun. As you see, it's made out of river cane. It's been laid out to dry right there. So, and it don't grow too straight, as you see. So what would happen is we'd take it and warm the joints over a fire and bend it straight. After that, we would take another piece with an arrowhead on, on the end, and just like run it through and bust the joints out. After we did that, we would fill it with river sand and then take this and run it through again, like a natural sandpaper to smooth out the insides so a dart could travel really easily through it. Now our darts would go anywhere from a few inches in length to about a foot and a half. They were also made of yellow locust, and as you see, this one's been fire hardened, so it could be reused multiple times. Chewie, do you want to give us a demonstration? Do it, dude. Now, just like the barrel of a gun, the longer it is, the greater, uh, the more accuracy it is at distances. And if you'll notice, when you hold it, he's going to hold, hold it in close grip with this. Okay, it gives, gives, better act, gives you better control over because if you hold it like this at length, your arm will get tired and start swaying and you'll start move, missing, miss your target. Oh! You feel the sound of it. As you, as you heard, he didn't, he didn't just... He sent it flying. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> I didn't do the intro, but yes, yeah, so we're in the that village now. There's Kiani. Can... Off bird trap. There's the lovely traps there. There's the bird trap. Yeah. The bigger the trap, the bigger the prey. So we're learning about the Himalayan raccoon over there. On down the way. Yeah, well, it's in the house. There's a bird. Oh, there's an actual bird. Wow. Well, a replica. An effigy of a bird. I know. The fish a trap. A spokesmodel. <laughs> oh, I can smell. Trust me. Welcome to the housing. How's your light? Oh, this is pretty good. I've actually got a low light setting if I need to, but well, at least right here it's not so bad because we're here in the doorway. It's not bad. No, so it's still got the door light. I love the floor, like how it, there's almost like the landing strip here versus what's on the side. I'll tell you one thing. Hmm. That's a real fire. Oh. Yeah. Real life. I'm a little warmer than I want to be. Stick my butt in it. Oh, yeah. That's real fire. Oh, this has got my back. Not there. Okay. You really can't see. Oh, there we go. 
Well, we messed up a song from the toilet. Now. What? Ass on fire? <laughs> That's what I Oh, there is one. See? It's a little muddy water, but there there's fishies in there. I have quarter in my pocket. Oh, you have quarter? Oh. Yeah, I'm done. Big the fishies. <laughs> yeah, I like the frenzy. Fishy hunger games. You're sick. <laughs> You're welcome. Fishy hunger games. <laughs> that was so cool. There you go. I'm just, just dropping a few, man. I just dropped everything I had. <laughs> they're pretty good at this. Oh, yeah. They, they, they know where their food comes from. Nom, 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 nom. And what you see in the middle is a representation of the ash that would be accumulated over the course of burning for a year. And um, each, the seven point star you see around it is also representative of the clan and the type of wood that the clan was responsible for bringing into the fire. All the clan, all the wood from each clan would be burnt um, at one time to symbolize unity. And once a year, um, in October, late October, early November, embers would be moved out of the fire pit into a clay bowl and the ash, the remaining wood, would be moved out. And at the same time, all the women in the village would put out the fires in their homes, and they'd come to the council house door to get embers to bring back to their own fires, to rekindle their own homes, and here the, the embers would be moved back in, and the new fire would be started. There would be two men posted here all year round, whose only duty would be to make sure that the fire didn't go out. And if it were to go out for any reason at all, the men would be put to death. So they put a pretty heavy price on the, <laughs> the pressure. Fire. And the spirit you see up here is what the beloved woman would wear. She would sit in on the council meetings and she would have a council of seven women, from, one from each clan. And they were called the beloved women or the war women. And they made decisions on the prisoners that each um, village would take in as a result of the war of the conf or the conflict. And if the prisoner had committed crimes, but then the beloved women decided that the crime was forgivable and that the people were useful to the clan, they could be adopted into the clan and into the tribe. And if the crime was pretty bad, but they would still be of use to the village, they could be taken on as slaves. Or, if the crime was super serious and it's the worst thing that's ever been, hap been happening to the village and the people, the beloved women could decide that the prisoner was going to be put to death. And you'll be seeing this clip at the end of every single video through Vloguka. So, um, yeah. Since I didn't do a, like, in, since a l some of these are just random clips thrown together, I figured I'd put my outro here as well. So enjoy the, hopefully... 31 days of Vloguka, and don't forget, make sure to read the description for more information on what else I'm doing during the month of December. Anyway, love, peace, bye, and thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing, and of course, sharing. Love you guys. Bye!